Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trend Crusher podcast. I'm Peter K, aka Trend Crusher. And this week, I'm really excited to have on the podcast Canadian rock musician Ian Blurton. Now, Ian Blurton has a career that spanned over three decades. He's performed in bands like Change of Heart, Come On, uh, and far more that I can even name right now, right? His current act is Ian Blurton's Future Now. So they released their second album, Second Skin, via Pajama Party and Seeing Red Records, and it's out right now. Now, before we get to my chat with Ian, uh, as always, hit the subscribe button below and stay tuned every week for chats like this. So that's all for my introduction this time. Let's get in straight to my chat with Ian Blurton. So, hi, Ian. Ian, it's an honor and pleasure to have you on the Trend Crusher podcast. Thanks so much. Right. Thank you for having me. Now, you know, I was wondering how to introduce you, and I was actually doing a bit of research, and I saw Alan Cross called you the elder statesman of uh, Toronto Rock. So I think I'm just going to borrow that phrase from him. <laughs> I think that kind of describes you really well. <clears throat> uh, th- but at this point, you know, considering you just released... Uh, the I like I really like how the name is Ian Blurton's uh, Future Now. The second album under that, how does it feel? Does it re- do you really feel like an elder statesman at this point? I don't actually. No, I um, I think that like music, the, there's a one beautiful thing about music is how like it kind of keeps well at least it, with me it makes me feel young and uh, I feel a certain like freedom and joy in playing music and uh, so I elder part really doesn't come into it unless I'm like loading gear and I'm like wow I'm I'm a lot older and this hurts more than normal. Yeah let, let me start off with this and I think this is an interesting way to start because uh like like before we started recording I told you about which feels really like long for me and I'm sure it feels the same for you buying uh the come on cd because that was cds back then uh I think if I'm right. not mistaken I went down to the HMV uh in Toronto and bought it, which is right at the Young Street. And all those years later, now when I'm hearing uh, Second Skin, which just released, right? Uh, how does it feel like, oh, because you've been through so many bands, how does it feel now to have something? Does it feel new, fresh? Because it's a definitely a newer sound, I would say. Is that the correct oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. You know, and I think it's all about like, you know, a sound of a band, uh, even though my name is at the front of the band, it's like the the four people involved create the the whole thing. And so there's always, you know, new energy and uh, just, you know, it's a different band. So it's like, um, even though my name's there, it's like it is the four people and that create helps create a, a new thing and keep it exciting, you know. Um, I haven't actually played with another guitar player in quite a long time. So there's like lots of new things in there, you know. And and I think that that's what I really admire, right? Is that so many years later, you still kind of got that drive, if I may use that word, right? Like making new music and trying. Uh, but for someone who's watching this and has no idea what Ian Blurton's uh, future now is or even who Ian Blurton is, like I'm, I'm kind of gushing here <laughs> talking to you, but how, how would you just kind of like briefly tell someone about yourself and just what future now is? Oh God. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I think music is, you know, like one of the main forces in my life. So it's like, I'm always making music. Um, I'm a musician and um, the band is sort of, you know, uh, amalgamation of like a lot of uh 70s influences and stuff but I, I think we're trying to be a little bit modern and like you know you know some of the beats and stuff are a little bit you know different than what would be going on in the 70s so I don't know I I, I like I think you can make something new out of something old and like the idea of like always just rehashing a 70s thing uh I think if we were doing that, I think it would become very tiresome. And I, and I like the way we kind of like, I'm not saying we're doing it perfectly or anything, but um, I like the way we kind of mash things together and try and create something a little bit fresh sounding, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things. And just to quickly touch upon, I mean, I, I know quite early in the conversation, I'm talking about just dealing with, you know, 
COVID and the coronavirus and stuff. But a recurring theme I've noticed when I talk to musicians and also just, you know, fellow music fans is that in that year or so, we ended up finding comfort in things that we knew, right? Which was familiar, whether it was music mm. or any other art form. Uh, and I think right. that was something which kind of helped, if I may use the term, just help everyone stay sane, right? In in, in right. that uh, thing. And uh, for me personally, I really just enjoyed listening to music because, and the kind of music I also looked back was music I enjoyed in my early teens or later teens also. Right. And then also stuff that just helped me escape, right? Right. And, when, when, when you try and put it into perspective, this was the first time ever, whether it was Toronto or Mumbai, Bombay, where I live, people were just sitting at home. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like food, too. Like, I think a lot of people really got into food for a while as well, you know, and it's like, I, I agree with you. Like, I started listening to a lot more music and, and like, we recorded the record in uh god i think it was september 2019 so like the whole lockdown i basically had a, this project to work on which was oh, wow. very help, helpful mentally right like so we had recorded the beds and then i had to you know put everything together and add vocals and things like that so okay um, so, i'm great grateful for music you know like yeah. yeah no and actually you kind of answered the next question i had because considering just the timing of the release right a lot of bands have been releasing music in the past eight months or so. And what that mm -hmm. has been termed is just the Corona release, right? But you yes, guys yeah. actually recorded uh, all the way in uh, 2019. And what's cool is while you said you all recorded the beds, you all actually recorded on the Rolling Stones uh, mobile uh, recording studio, which is all the way yeah. up now, sorry, National Music Center in Calgary. W what was that yeah. experience like? Oh, that was amazing. So they, they have like an artist in residence program. So you apply and um, they gave us um, uh, five days in the studio with, uh, and part of it was we had to play a live show. So um, nice. for basically they have, they had bought the Rolling Stones mobile. Like, first of all, I should say that the museum has been like insanely supportive of a lot of musicians. Um, the, my first experience with them was we needed Mellotron on the record and mm. we're like, where can we find a Mellotron? And we uh, emailed them or somebody piped up and said, just come into the music center and record the Mellotron here. We'll give you, you know, two hours and a couple wow. of microphones. And we're like, okay, that's amazing. And then mm. struck up this conversation, you know, and they were like, you should apply for the artist in residence. And then we got it. And uh, so it's like the, the whole studio, you know, one side of the building is a studio. The other side is a museum of Canadian music. And on music, on the studio side, they have the Rolling Stones mobile, they have a Helios console, I believe from Olympic. And then they have a board that uh, the first couple of Merciful Fate records were made on. Whoa. So it's like, it's just a history of like, they have like amps, you know, like we were using a Neil Young microphone and an amp. Um, we had, um, I don't know if you know who Randy Bachman is from BTO, yeah. Bachman Turner Overdrive. So he had like 250 guitars there that um, I'm left handed, but Aaron, the other guitar player was playing like, you know, 59 Strat, um, you know, just incredible, incredible stuff that, um, you know, museum quality stuff that was playable. So it was amazing. Like, and, and, you know, part of the reason I wanted to record there was because they had a Mellotron. And uh, so I had like a, you know, beautiful Mellotron sitting in front of me for five days. And I don't know, it's just, it's a really fantastic place. Wow. So if nothing else, you've made a great pitch for everyone to travel to Calgary and just go visit this place because that sounds like musicians heaven, right? Or any music oh, it's band to be unbelievably honest. Unbelievably musicians heaven. And like, you know, they um, you know, I don't know the people who started it that well, but like the the way they've set it up and it's just it's just really great place for uh for Canadian music. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things uh, about Canada, right? It's just that it's so supportive uh, towards the arts. Yes. And just just the way it's kind of uh, focused. And it's no surprise that there's so much so much music coming out of Canada, right? And I think you've been oh, yeah. uh, just an observer and just also been part of so many albums. I mean, 
like when i was mm-hmm. looking at just the kind of body of work that you've put out aside from being in bands i mean like wow <laughs> So it, it just kind I've had of... a good run. I've had a good run. No complaint. <laughs> so, but you know, so... like in Canada also, we have the winter, right? Which is the isolation period, which is like, that's when people write records, right? It's like, so it's like, oh, well, it's almost built into, you know, the world here. You know, it's like, well, there's four months where I'm not going out. So I'm going to write a record. So, so you get a actually, lot of that. You, you actually hit the nail on the head as to why I don't want to travel in Canada between say probably September, October, all the way to like February, right? Because it's cold. Oh, try touring in it. Try touring in it. Oh my. (laughs) I I bet there are a few stories behind that. (laughs) Oh my God. Sliding off the road and yeah, oh yeah. But but I got I got I got burned once by grabbing the back of the van handle. It was so cold out. I didn't realize it. And I just put my hand on the metal and it was like, oh my God, that hurts so much. Wow. So, so I'm going to pause the thought on the production, right? Because I think maybe I'll have to do a separate episode with you, but I'm going to like <laughs> t- touch upon it, especially at least some of the releases I've really enjoyed. I want to touch upon uh, quickly with you. But uh yeah, one of the things I really enjoyed about, you know, Second Skin is just how, like you said, right, like, while it's a familiar sound of the psychedelia 70s, and especially like those who enjoy that sound will definitely uh, enjoy it, but it's done in a fresh way. So tell me about that time from like the time you uh, recorded the beds in 2019, till it actually finally releasing. That seems like quite some time. But like you said, that really helped out, right? Yeah, it did. Um, and, you know, I mean, part of the reason was the, the length was uh, one of my best friends, his name's Daryl Smith, and he mixed the record. And he just, you know, he just didn't want to rush it. There was no reason. I mean, that was one another thing. There was no reason to rush a record because obviously nothing's going on. Um, a lot of, you know, I did the guitar tracks over a bunch of times and things like some of the guitar tracks and just making sure things were right as opposed to, you know, rushing through and and having you know a tour coming up or you know a release date that wasn't you know when the record's not ready I've you know I've been in that situation too you know but but having gone through this experience right and and I'm like leaving any world changing catastrophe and stuff like that is this kind of something like you'd like to replicate for the next record in terms of the pace of the way you kind of record it is there something that you would like to repeat no actually we're we're actually almost finished the next record and wow. um it's uh it's a pretty different record actually i i think it's a reaction to the just the amount of notes that are on second skin <laughs> it's like it kind of just you know brought it back a little bit okay okay so that's so my that's... second skin is actually very hard to play live like uh we're in rehearsals right now and it's like it's a uh, it's it's quite difficult at least for me. Uh, I definitely want to touch upon, and it's really hard not to talk to you about production. I know I said I'm going to do a separate episode, but <laughs> when I think about it, right, and I was just looking at, I, I'm not sure if you can give me an exact number or you've lost track, but you've engineered and mixed over 100 albums. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm around 120 now, I think, somewhere wow. in that vicinity. Wow. Now, now some of the bands that I really enjoyed uh, and I think for our listeners would not be a surprise is Blood Ceremony. I really loved that. Like uh, mm-hmm. that that sound of theirs was just so different and especially with the flute. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. The, but on so the talented more, too. Yeah. Uh, but on the more... Like musically ex- talented. Yeah. and But on the more extreme then, I didn't realize that you worked on some of the Cursed uh, albums. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. Number two. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah. That I, I really miss that band. But other oh than God. these two releases that I, I mean, these two bands that I was really excited for, tell me some of your uh, favorite memories from being a producer, right? Like, what what's something oh, that well, really sticks out in your mind? I mean, making that cursed record is definitely sticks out in my mind because, like, I like you know, as a producer, and and I'm not saying anything about any of the other bands that I've ever worked with, but some bands come in and they are just so driven like they are just so on point they've rehearsed you know it's just 
you realize that like all you have to do is really put up the microphones and as long as you don't screw up the recording it's going to be amazing right because the band is so good and cursed are just punishing punishing yeah and uh yeah. um the same goes for this band uh i don't know if you ever heard of them they're called tricky woo they were from montreal and i okay. worked on a record called Some sometimes i cry and okay. it was again it was the same kind of thing just like driven um yeah like if you like pure like straight up rock and roll they are an incredible band okay so that's definitely i think for the listeners and me to definitely mm -hmm. add uh to our to listen list but uh, <laughs> yeah i mean I, and i know this is tough right but uh, and if 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 you want to kind of answer it but what some of the things that over the years you've seen that you know common mistakes that bands make right common things that you would think when coming into a studio that they would do if you could kind of share oh. some of the things tuning <laughs> tuning is the, like the main the main issue like unless unless you want the sound of your guitars to be out of tune which is hmm. totally legit like people do that all the time it sounds great um just simple things like getting your guitar set up properly you know that's uh that's a that's for me that's the hurdles i have to overcome is like the tuning of the drums and the tuning it's basically tuning yeah. um that's the most important thing really you know songs are much easier to mix when everything's in tune um all that kind of stuff you know okay wow i, I yeah and i think that's one of the things i guess that will also just cut down your studio time and everything just by like, oh. <laughs> like every it, it'll cut down on everything you know like <laughs> if that's if there's one thing that people can take away just tuning you know okay okay that that that's definitely uh something to uh keep in mind but i i want to just kind of dial back quickly on future now right i mean you in 2019 released signals through the flames uh, now you've got uh, second skin and you i'm really glad to hear that you're already kind of done writing uh, the third album like right? what's that what's different in terms of just the songwriting or just the progression you've seen in future now compared to say some of your other acts how would you compare that or even if is it, that's a mm. fair question to ask yeah no that's fair um uh i think this band writes a lot more songs and throws away a lot more songs than <laughs> any other band i've ever been in like seriously we write you know we wrote probably 20 for the last record and uh there's 12 extra songs right now for the new record so there it's just a lot of writing you know like But um if i may just uh kind of double down on what you just said what do you all do with the material discarded is that just completely thrown out or possibly uh there'll probably it? be an ep there'll, there'll probably be a digital ep before the next record um oh, wow. if i get around to it um uh but yeah i, I mean some of the songs were quite bad from signals through the flames so <laughs> they will not be coming out <laughs> yeah because i'm you know, always i think we have a we have a very specific idea of like what our the basis of the band is so if if it strays uh i mean it can stray but if it strays too far then it's like uh you know it's probably not going to happen on the record you know? yeah because i've always been very curious about like especially like in the digital age right like if you compare to and i can't believe i'm saying this but like back in the day when you were recording to say like tape and stuff like that right then there was mm -hmm. some kind of thing that okay you know if you're recording something that you're not going to use it's kind of like a wastage of sorts but in the digital it's never seen that way right and no it's not and sometimes i also speak to bands especially who do uh, releases really fast right like how or every other year or so is that how do you kind of discard that material or so because i've heard of certain bands who like literally go revisit some ideas or just mm -hmm. there may be riffs or things like that and in a certain right. different time it kind of may work or may not work but that's right. a very uh, interesting approach that you all use That, well actually i mean the the acoustic intro to uh too high the sky on the new on second skin that i've had that for god 20 years probably wow so it just found its place now you know 
Wow, that's that's crazy. I, I didn't realize that's how wow, 20 years is a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, well, like, you know, they, you know, they say good ideas will stick around in your mind so that like, if it is a bad idea and you can't remember how to play it, then maybe it probably wasn't that good of an idea, you know? Yeah. Okay. But so at this point, I want to also quickly understand, and I should have asked this slightly earlier, uh, how tough does it become for you to kind of wear different hats, right? I mean, like, I'm glad you said that you got someone to mix a uh, second skin. But does do you like literally have to like segment it that okay, the musician in Blurton and the producer in Blurton, and how do they kind of or is, does that not happen? Those are two separate. Those are two entirely different people. Like um, the musician would do things that the producer probably wouldn't want him to do. <laughs> um, but also like. Uh, the reason I hire people to mix her exit, I have a really hard time mixing my own stuff. Like, um, it, I just get, we get better results when it's somebody else for whatever reason, even if I record it. Um, I just think the, the fresh perspective on it, you know, maybe is good. Like, and if you can just kind of elaborate a bit for me, I, well, for example, it. like I, there was a lot more overdubs on second skin than, that are on the record and Daryl, one of the, like, who's one of, you know, he's allowed to do anything when he's mixing and he just stripped stuff back, you know? And he was like, this is how the song goes. And that's what a good mixer does, right? Is like, they, they might take something out you love, but yeah. they're taking it out because it's unnecessary, you know? And I think that's what happens also, right? Like, personally, I feel that sometimes it's better just to get a second opinion or a more, uh, objective opinion because you get so oh yeah in love with a certain idea that you just yeah. can't let it go right and yeah yeah be and just... sometimes those ideas are terrible you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i know what you mean like years later like what was i thinking <laughs> yeah <laughs> but okay come on now i, I know this is going to be slightly hard for you but I'm, I'm getting this opportunity to talk to you. So definitely I'm going to put you on the spot. Current or past Canadian or Toronto bands that you'd, or releases maybe you'd like to talk about, say about two or three, that maybe some of our like listeners- Like any, any, anything? Yeah. Okay, well, um, okay. Uh, well, Simply Saucer, Cyborgs Re Revisited. I don't know if you know that record. They were from Hamilton. Um, they were sort of the first kind of like, oh gosh, they're sort of a bridge between Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd, and uh, Arubu, um, and like art, art rock. Um, and they made a record in I got I don't know the year might have been 77 but it didn't come out too much later and it's been reissued probably three or four times at this point and uh it's one of my favorite records of all time um it's deranged it's completely deranged and uh they had a synth player who who made noises as opposed to like was a proggy synth player so um that's probably one of my number ones um oh man let me think um there was a hardcore band from toronto called no mind in the 80s who were insanely influential on uh, a, a lot of bands because they were like sort of the players version of hardcore like insanely great guitar player bass player drummer and well, and the singer they're all really good and they were sort of like if blue cheer and black flag were kind of like mushed wow. together i guess is like just the psych of like that kind of freak out rock and then heavy hardcore basically are um, either of these still available like on records uh i don't know like the this uh simply saucer definitely came out again like a couple of years ago um and they added a live show and no mind uh i don't know actually you know mm -hmm. uh it was on uh Man, I can't even remember what label it was on. <laughs> I, th I think this it was is so long ago. But they're an incredible band. They were supposed to do a show a couple of years ago, but then COVID happened. Yeah. 
Um, I'm trying to think. When the, do you want three? Take take your pick. I mean, it's it's up to you. If you. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, oh, Northern Haze. Uh, they're a Canadian band, but they're from up north, um, like way up north. And um, they're, I don't even know how to describe it. It's sort of um, indigenous music mixed with like 80s Aussie, like Randy Rhodes Aussie. Um, uh, it's a very hard record to describe. Um, awesome. but it's fantastic. Uh, a bunch of people turned me onto it and, uh, it's really great. There's awesome. three. Awesome. Thanks. So I think like the reason I love doing this is because every time I talk to a musician, I come on to like three or four new records. or I come to know about three, four more records that I'd never heard of before. And right. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think mission accomplished this time. Right. Uh, That's actually something I love about touring is like, you know, you get to a town you've never been to before and, and, you know, people are like, oh, this band, that band, you know, and like, this is a really cool art gallery or whatever, you know, what just cool stuff like that. Uh, that that's probably one of my favorite parts of touring. Th thanks so much. I think that that's the great thing about travel in general, right? That each time you kind of travel, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of discover something new. Uh, what's another part of touring that you really enjoy? Because you talked about in the start of the conversation, just how you didn't like touring in the winter. What's another aspect yeah. of touring that you really enjoy? Oh, well, I just, I, the local, you know, just being able to uh, take in some of the local ideas and, you know, like, well, I love food, so definitely nice. food. Um, and uh, just traditions of the areas and, you know, it's a huge world out there and it's it's impossible to know about everything and so it's just nice to be able to go somewhere and discover something cool and also you know like being in a band like people will take you sometimes to like cool places after the show or point you in the right direction so you get this kind of like built-in tour guide type thing even though it's a different person every day you know they're they're showing you what's interesting and stuff so yeah. And I think what one thing about Canada that people don't realize is just how large it is, right? Like, oh, <laughs> huge. <laughs> like, I, I, actually, I was going to bring that up earlier is like, that is one thing about the, you know, the support system in Canada is that people realize that, you know, there's a stretch where if you're going west, you are driving between eight and 12 hours a day, every day for a week, just to get from the shows. And so I think that the people who appreciate, you know, show up for those shows, appreciate the fact that that's like, that's a 12 hour drive, you know? Yeah. You know, even if you're a terrible yeah. band, I'm going to support you because that's a 12 hour drive. <laughs> and if it's in the winter time, that's even more so, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. T totally. I mean, I, I can't even imagine 12 hours. I mean, I don't drive, but I, I can't even right. imagine 12, 12 hours. Uh, at oh, the stretch. you go you go stir crazy, you know, just sitting in that band. <laughs> While on the topic of uh, touring, I noticed that y'all are doing a record release show on the 13th of August at the Horseshoe Tavern. And mm -hmm. you've got it like a mixed lineup in there. But t tell me about that show and the programming of it. But also, what's your plan for touring uh, later on? Because it's actually summer in North America. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um the show is, uh, well, it's, we're, uh, we have a couple of great bands, uh, Sam Coffey and the Iron Lungs, who are like, um, I don't know, I guess they're punk rock band, but uh, <laughs> they're kind of a gang. They all dress the same. And then Sick Things are sort of like a Thin Lizzy meets Big Star kind of thing. Okay. Um, and just the horseshoe is like, uh, the reason we're playing there is just because they've been really great to us for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh for people who don't know it's you know it's where punk rock was first uh you know happened in toronto or at least one of the first places and um you know it's it's 70 years old it's like they had country bands there you know everyone's played there basically yeah you know i used to work there too so it's like i have oh, wow. a <laughs> i have a personal connection to it so okay 
And are, are you all planning any kind of tours or something? Um, we're just trying to figure that out. You know, like uh, being in a, the one thing about the band uh, is that everyone is, because they're all so good, they're all in a lot of bands. And Glenn, the drummer, <laughs> is actually in one of the biggest bands in Canada. So it's like, we just sort of have to work around all that, which is fine. Um, because, you know, honestly, right now, there's just so many bands out on the road um, yeah. because of the COVID. Um, kind of feel like maybe we should just wait a little bit longer you know yeah and and is i just wanted to kind of understand uh from your perspective uh because we talked a bit about just like venues uh and things like that it, have you been out to shows uh in the past few months hey i have not i went to i went to see black rose because the guitar player from earthless was playing with them and i wanted to see that and it was an outdoor show um but no i haven't been out Okay, because I want to just get an understanding of are people coming back to shows uh, again? Because that's something I I've noticed. They... Sorry, go ahead. No, because that's something I've noticed here in uh, Bombay, right? Is that people have been deprived pretty much uh, of mm -hmm. going out uh, for shows. So even if it's a Wednesday or Thursday night, people are showing up now, which was oh, kind really? of very odd uh, earlier. So, right. so that's one good thing that, you know, things are kind of getting back and people are more comfortable attending shows. So oh, that's amazing. To, yeah, I that's amazing. I, I haven't actually been to any shows, so I couldn't even, I couldn't tell you, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But at least one good thing is uh, with it being summer is that this festival's back again, right? At least the festivals uh, that are happening. So mm -hmm. th that's something to kind of look forward to. Uh, I kind of want to wind down when, I want to wind down in a way which may make you think a bit. But when, when I look at your career, right? I mean, you've spent like 35 years in the Canadian music industry. You've played so many with so many bands with a variety of sound. You've had an impact in terms of production on far more bands. What's next? I mean, what kind of... Or, or was there any plan from the beginning... And or is there now? Uh, no, there was no plan from the beginning. We were just, uh, you know, my first band, it was called Change Fart. And, you know, I was in that band for 15 years, basically, like from, you know, 16 to wow. 30, 32 or whatever. And so there was no, there was no like grand plan. I think in a lot of ways, um, we were almost anti plan, you know, like uh, <laughs> just, you know, like the fact, like, you know, because we were, no, we did, there was no plan. And just like the way we wrote music even was like, we didn't, we did not want to be a certain type of band. So there would be influences from everything. Right. And that was probably our biggest problem. Um, um, the plan now is just like, uh, uh, I think just continue with what we're doing musically. And, uh, you know, I think everyone really enjoys it. Um, and, you know, and you can plan as much as you want, but yeah, you know, it doesn't always work out. And uh, I think it can be more of a disappointment when you're trying to do something and then something else shows up that, mm. and you're kind of like fight against it. And that, 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 I don't think that's necessarily a good way to play music. I don't know. It's probably different than most people, but. Um, no, and that's, I, just, I, mean, I, I think going with the flow and letting, letting whatever is happening happen is good. You know, yeah, no, because you can always say you can always say no to it later. You know, it's like, um, but no. yeah, I think going with the flow is good. No, and I totally respect that, right? I mean, like everyone's very different as an individual. So part of the mm -hmm. reason was just a, the of the part of the reason of me asking that question is just to kind of get an insight and understand uh, your thing. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I didn't have this originally as one of my questions, but since you've already mentioned it, uh, album three is already written. Uh, recorded. Wow, recorded also? Oh, yeah, 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 it's recorded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just so, a few, like a few more vocals and stuff. And yeah. Okay, so then I'm not going to make you spill the beans, so to say, but for anyone who's listened to Signal Through the Frames and Second Skin, you said you'll have dialed things down a bit. Uh, what what more can they expect, or will they just be surprised? 
uh, might be a little bit surprised. There's a little bit more of like a Def Leppard on through the night uh, vibe going on, I guess. Wow. Some of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just, I, I, it's not necessarily dialed down. It's just the amount of notes per person. There's more space, I guess, okay. is what, uh, yeah. So, and that was intentional just because the second skin is just like a constant bombard of, you know, things. So, and also, you know, to have every record be slightly different too, I think is, is important, you know, and then, you know, a lot of ways you, you have to look at the live show and it's like having to play so many notes over and over again for long periods of time might just be a little bit draining. So it'd be nice to have a few songs that are not quite so draining, you know? I think, you know, even Metallica, like, uh, you know, you read stuff after Injustice for All tour where they were like, oh, my God, we had to play so many notes for like, you know, 18 <laughs> months before they toured that record. You know? Yeah, I, I can totally imagine. And I think, you know, and, we're, you know, there's more of a prog influence on this record. And I don't like we're not like a prog, prog band, you know, it's like, you know. No, so I'm glad you're saying that, right? Because the way I'm also thinking about it is from a setlist perspective, right? You can kind of mix mm -hmm. things up uh, and have things uh, kind of a bit of a change. Otherwise, you just like end up kind of getting stuck in that same kind of, uh, like you said, the notes per second and all of that, right? So Yeah, yeah. and there. it's like nice to have that as an element of the setlist, but to make the whole setlist. Although, you know, so, again, some bands can do it and it's amazing um you know some bands are so good at it um and it's just yeah i think just having that uh you know depending on how you feel in the night too and being able to drop in a, a simpler song is, is a good thing awesome all right so you know Ian, it's been a pleasure talking to you oh and thank you so much you it, it, it kind of made me nostalgic also in a sense so thank you <laughs> for that uh in there and i'm definitely looking forward to hearing the next album and probably having a chat with you when that's out again. I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. And that was Ian Blurton, truly the elder statesman of Toronto Rock, as described by Canadian journalist Alan Cross. I really enjoyed talking to him, not just about his music, but also just the production that he's worked on. So I think definitely I should get him back just to talk producing music because I think that's a really fascinating aspect which not a lot of people are talking about, honestly. And that's all for this episode. So, like I mentioned in the start, hit subscribe uh, below and uh, definitely stay tuned for more chats like this. And I'll see you guys next week. Cheers.